Okay, I'm going to introduce Dr. Sarah Jaser today, who is joining us from Vanderbilt University by way of Florida. Um, so Dr. Jaser is a pediatric psychologist who's been working with children and diabetes and their families for almost 15 years now. She obtained her undergraduate degree at Yale University and then got her PhD in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University. She is a tenured associate professor of pediatrics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And in Dr. Jaser's research, she's demonstrated the effects of adolescent coping, maternal adjustment, and parenting on adolescents' glycemic control and also on child and family quality of life. And Dr. Jaser has been a sought after speaker and collaborator. She's currently developing and testing interventions to improve outcomes in youth with diabetes and their families. And these include several NIH funded trials. She is testing a program to help mothers cope effectively with the stress of parenting teenagers with diabetes. She's testing a positive psychology intervention to reduce diabetes distress and also improve teenagers self-management and also in a sleep promoting program for children and teens with type one diabetes. Personally, I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Jaser and, Jaser and her team. We are a site for her R01 that is on positive psychology and it's a text-based intervention for teens with diabetes called the Thrive Project. Um, Dr. Jaser is a great collaborator and in addition to being a successful researcher, she provides clinical service to families of children with diabetes and she serves as a mentor to her research team, including endocrine fellows and also early career faculty members. Sarah was supposed to come and speak in person at Children's back in May, and so we're very glad that she agreed to work with us via Zoom and share her work, and even doing that while she started a family vacation this week. So, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Jaser, and Sarah, the screen control is all yours. All right, thanks so much, Randy. Hopefully this will be a seamless start. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me and I'm, I'm glad it worked out even if it's not in person and maybe at, at some future date I can come back to, to see you in DC. Um, so as Randy mentioned, I'm uh, at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I'm in the division of uh, pediatric endocrinology and diabetes. Um, I have no relevant conflicts of interest to report. <laughs> I'm so used to doing these disclosure slides that I felt like I just needed to keep it in. Um, so I was going to start by uh, doing a little background information on type 1 diabetes, knowing that um, not everybody has the same background on this. So I'm just going to do a brief overview. Um, so type 1 diabetes occurs when the pancreas stops producing insulin. It's one of the most prevalent childhood chronic illnesses occurring in about 1 in 400 people. And uh, it involves a really complex daily treatment regimen. And I'll go into more detail on that in a minute. And one of the things that's unique about type one diabetes in terms of um, childhood illnesses is that the child and family are responsible for most of the diabetes management. And so it's not the kind of condition where you're coming into the medical center for treatment. It's really um, being managed by the child and family at home. And adolescence is a time when the responsibility for diabetes care shifts from parents to children. And a lot of my work has been with adolescents, both clinically and research work, because that transition can be so difficult. Um, and then I included the, this picture here on the slide to kind of show how diabetes management has changed over time. And so you can see here that it has become much more um, technologically advanced. And even in just the last five to 10 years, there's been huge advances in terms of new diabetes devices, the ability to use smartphones and smartwatches to monitor and manage diabetes, um, and also uh, better insulins, uh, better understanding of how everything's working physiologically. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, most of our pediatric patients still really struggle to meet the treatment goals. So this slide is based on data from the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange Clinical Registry, which includes um, over 50 clinics in the United States, and I think a couple in Canada. And uh, these are people who have type 1 diabetes. And here, um, at the time this was published, the goal for HbA1c, which is a measure of average blood glucose levels, was less than 7.5%. 
And you can see here that only 23% of the youngest children ages two to five were meeting that goal, 22% of the school age children and only 17% of adolescents. And this next slide um, shows that Unfortunately, this isn't really getting better with the increased use of diabetes technology. So the orange line represents the study cohort from this clinical registry in 2010 to 2012. Um, and then the blue line represents their more recent data from a cohort from 2016 to 2018. And I think that everyone expected with this um, increased use, particularly of continuous glucose monitoring, which is a way to um, monitor blood glucose levels more closely that we would see improvements. Um, and unfortunately we don't. And so actually in this 10 to 20 range, um, we see that the, the HbA1c or that average blood glucose level is even higher than it was uh, six years prior. Um, and keeping in mind that the goal was uh, A1c of less than 7.5 and now the goal is less than seven, hardly anyone is reaching that. Um, I also think that this graph is interesting because it shows that around age 25 to 30, we do see more people um, getting closer to goal, or at least we see a big decline in the, the mean A1C. And um, I think that points to uh, a couple things. One is that brain development is, um, is more complete by that age. And so those executive function skills or the ability to problem solve and um, think ahead <laughs> Are, are finally developed at that point. Um, and also people's lives tend to be a little more stable. Um, you're not dealing with growth hormones and things like that at that point. Um, so even though this can be kind of a, a disappointing slide or a frustrating slide, I think it also uh, is an opportunity for us to see that there is a lot of room for improvement here and that um, the the medicines and the diabetes devices aren't enough to get us there. And so I think for behavioral scientists like me and Randy and Maureen, um, it's really a call to action that um, there's, there's ways we can intervene to really help these families with diabetes management. So when we think about why it's so hard for people to manage diabetes, um, I think that this figure can be helpful in thinking about um, all the, the components of diabetes management. Um, so Karishma Dye was a fellow with me at, at Vanderbilt and now she's on the faculty there. And she created this figure um, as part of a review paper that we did. And I really like including it when I give presentations because I think it helps to show just how complex this is, um, both as a clinician and as a researcher. So this is not something that's easy to measure. Um, it's not something that's easy to fix because uh, there's so many aspects and really no one is uh, achieving perfect um, adherence to this diabetes treatment regimen. So I'm gonna run through these in a little bit more detail because some of them come back later. Um, so the basis for most diabetes decisions is uh, blood glucose levels. And so it's really important that people know what their levels are. And uh, traditionally people were using glucose meters to check their blood sugar, which involved a finger stick to get a drop of blood and they were um, asked to do that before each meal, before bedtime, um, before driving, before sports. And so at a minimum, people were supposed to be checking four times a day. It could be as many eight, as eight or nine times a day, especially if they um, weren't feeling well or there were changes in schedule. Uh, and that's a lot to ask, especially for adolescents um, who may not want to be checking in front of their peers if they feel kind of self-conscious about diabetes management. So as I mentioned in the last uh, five to 10 years, there's really been a big increase in the use of continuous glucose monitors, which are uh, sensors that are placed on the skin and do an interstitial uh, reading of blood glucose levels and you get a number about every five minutes. And so it's nearly continuous. Um, and those numbers can be shared to a smartphone or even a smartwatch. Uh, and they can be shared with other people like parents or school nurses or coaches. And um, for some families and kids, this has been a huge game changer and it has really um, changed the way they manage their diabetes and it's really given them insights into how their blood glucose responds uh, to things like different foods or exercise. Um, but for a lot of families, uh, when they come in for diabetes clinic visits, we realize they haven't really looked at these numbers or logged these numbers or tracked these numbers, which brings me to this next one. And so traditionally people had like their paper log book and they wrote their numbers down. And the idea was that they would share this with their, um, their diabetes healthcare providers, but also that they could start to see some patterns. 
Um, and now with the, the smart uh, approach, people are able to use apps to track these numbers. Um, but we see that a lot of families, it's almost too much data or too much information and they're not really logging it or tracking it themselves. They kind of want someone to explain it to them. Um, the next point here is counting carbohydrates. So most of the kids that we see in our clinic are on a flexible diabetes regimen, which means that they can pretty much eat whatever they want, but they have a, a ratio of insulin to carbohydrates. So they have to be um, accurately counting how many carbohydrates they eat. And that can be really tricky, especially if um, you're going out to eat or you're at a party where someone else prepared the food and you are just really guesstimating a lot of the time about how many carbohydrates are in that food. Um, the other thing I think with teenagers especially is that they tend to kind of graze or snack in the afternoons and evenings. And so they might think uh, to themselves, I'll, I'll take insulin after this snack, but then the snack kind of lasts two or three hours. And so at that point, their blood sugar is pretty high um, and they kind of miss the window. So um, giving meal and snack insulin based on that carbohydrate count. So there's some mental math that has to happen there with calculating the carbohydrates and dividing it by the ratio. Um, and then they're also giving long acting insulin either with an insulin pump or with injections, um, constantly monitoring for hypo and hyperglycemia, which is the low blood sugars and high blood sugar levels. And then beginning to recognize glucose patterns and adjusting insulin doses, which requires kind of that higher level of thinking and planning and finally communicating with providers between visits as needed. So you can see that this is a lot to ask of anyone and especially um, during adolescence when there's a lot of competing priorities, um, we see that uh, it's really challenging and that's, that's part of why those uh, percent of kids who are meeting those goals um, is thought to be related to how difficult it is to manage during adolescence. So my research team has really focused on identifying risk and protective factors for diabetes management and health outcomes, and then trying to figure out ways to um, measure those and intervene to improve them. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, several of these, uh, stress, parental distress, parental involvement, coping and sleep. And I'm going to uh, do kind of a quick overview of the first few and then focus a little bit more on sleep and how we uh, developed and tested uh, an intervention to promote sleep in adolescents. So a, a lot of my work has been guided by this transactional stress and coping model. And the idea here is that um, the stress of the chronic illness and the way that adolescents adjust to it. And, and when I think about adjustment, it's both uh, the physiological like health outcomes, but also psychosocial outcomes like quality of life or depressive symptoms. So we think that um, those outcomes are really mediated by how parents adjust to the stress of the chronic illness, how parents um, behave and how they parent, and then the coping of the child. And the reason this is maternal adjustment and not parental is that um, based on lots of research, uh, we know that moms are the ones who are typically involved in the day-to-day -day decisions for diabetes management, um, things like keeping track of supplies and asking kids about their blood glucose levels and helping them calculate their carbohydrate intake. Um, and even when fathers are involved, moms tend to report higher levels of stress and distress around diabetes management than fathers do. Um, so it's not that we don't think fathers are important. It's just that at least in my work, we've kind of uh, chosen to focus on mothers because they seem to be the ones who are struggling a little bit more with it. Um, and one of the things that we do is, is work with moms to encourage um, more paternal involvement so that dads are um, getting more involved in those daily decisions and the daily management. So I'm going to uh, highlight some of the key findings related to maternal adjustment. Um, so one of our earlier studies, we found that maternal depression negatively affected child adjustment through its influence on quality of life, coping, and family functioning. And that the mothers in this particular study uh, experienced clinically significant symptoms of depression, about 18% of them, and anxiety, 13%, which were associated with diabetes-related stress. And I know that um, I'm always citing Randy's work and then some of her studies, she's found even higher rates, especially among parents of kids who are recently diagnosed. And so we know that there, it is a really stressful uh, situation and it doesn't just go away. They tend to experience um, this distress related to the chronic stress of taking care of diabetes. 
Um, and finally, that mother symptoms of anxiety and depression were related to lower levels of child-centered parenting. So how they're dealing with it affects their parenting and that then has a trickle down effect on the kids. So um, looking more closely at some of these uh, results related to parenting, we did a study where we had um, parents and their adolescent children talk about diabetes related stress and we videotaped that conversation and coded it using the Iowa Family Interaction Rating Scales, which is an objective measure of parenting behaviors. And what we found was that collaborative parenting, which was um, a composite of these codes, which were positive reinforcement, so statements like, um, you've been doing a great job checking your blood sugar, or I like the way you remembered your supplies, um, attentive listening, and so that is both uh, the verbal of like, mm -hmm, yeah, and then uh, nonverbal cues of eye contact and nodding and even just physically turning toward their child. Those observed parenting behaviors predicted better glycemic control over 12 months. And then over-involved parenting, which was things like lecturing, um, a lot of should statements, and then intrusive behavior. So um, that could be, it really ranges to how we code that. So it could be even physical intrusiveness where they're kind of reaching over and adjusting the kid's clothes or um, uh, really taking over the conversation, but also um, intrusive in terms of parenting, of kind of uh, guiding the child to the answer they want, um, telling them what they should be thinking. And those predicted greater depressive symptoms in adolescents over 12 months. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting about these findings is that um, I think a lot of times when we're, we're trying to decide what we want to intervene on, we're thinking that it's going to have uh, either positive or negative effects on both the health outcomes and the psychosocial outcomes. And so this was a place where we really saw these differential effects so that the kind of more positive collaborative parenting was related to the health indicator. Whereas the more, uh, I guess you, we try not to call it negative, but over-involved parenting was related to the psychosocial outcomes. Um, and another key finding here was that single mothers in our sample exhibited significantly more over-involved and less collaborative parenting behaviors than married mothers or partnered mothers. Um, and this, I think, is also really interesting because uh, to my <laughs> earlier statement, we try not to think of the over-involved parenting as negative, um, and it's not really hostile. It's, it's really uh, coming out of this kind of worry a lot of times of like, my child's not doing what I think they need to be doing, and so I need to just keep telling them. Um, over and over. And so uh, particularly with the single moms, I think when they don't have someone to kind of share that uh, burden with, they're even more worried about how their child's doing and even sometimes how it reflects on them. And so you see a lot more of this kind of lecturing type behavior from those moms. So in terms of our research team's next steps related to uh, these predictors, um, as Randy mentioned, we are currently uh, conducting a trial to um, evaluate the effects of a communication and coping intervention for mothers of adolescents with type 1 diabetes. So this is a cognitive behavioral intervention um, that we deliver with phone calls with moms and also a Facebook group where they are receiving, um, well, we post content that's related to uh, these effective coping strategies and positive parenting strategies. So we're trying to come at it kind of two ways where we're teaching them um, adaptive coping strategies to deal with the stress of parenting a child with diabetes, and then also giving them some um, positive parenting strategies to improve communication with their child and to sort of boost those collaborative um, parenting behaviors that we saw were so helpful. So coming back to this model, the other piece um, that we haven't really talked about yet is the coping part. and. Um, Again, in some earlier studies, uh, we found that coping predicted adolescents' depressive symptoms and quality of life over 12 months. Um, and I trained at Vanderbilt with uh, Bruce Compass, and so his coping models really shaped my work as well. And so the idea is that there's uh, not really adaptive and maladaptive coping strategies, but depending on the situation, some strategies might be better than others. And so what we found was that primary control coping strategies, which are things like problem solving or trying to um, change the, the stressor, uh, and then secondary control engagement coping, which is things like acceptance or positive thinking, which are ways of trying to adapt to the stressor. We found that both of those predicted fewer symptoms of depression and better quality of life in our adolescents with diabetes, um, whereas disengagement coping or things like withdrawal and avoidance predicted poor outcomes. And I think that um, 
diabetes is, is kind of an interesting stressor to, to study because there are aspects that are um, somewhat controllable or where problem solving can be useful. So things like um, planning ahead for a trip or making sure you have your supplies or talking to a teacher or coach about diabetes. Um, but then there's other aspects that are really uncontrollable. And so trying to, to fix those might be less useful. Um, so things like feeling different from your peers or just this kind of burnout that we see of like, the, you know, it's never going away and the why me kind of aspect. Um, and so what we've learned is that both of those types of strategies are helpful as long as you're kind of matching them to, to the correct type of stress. Um, and we found that coping mediated the effects of diabetes risk related stress on adolescent adjustment. And because this was a longitudinal study and we had uh, three measures of these three time points where we measured these, we were able to um, truly show that coping was a mediator of stress on outcomes. And uh, as Randy mentioned, we are currently conducting a trial of a positive psychology intervention that we call Thrive. And um, based on our pilot work, we found that um, by boosting positive affect, we are able to promote more uh, use of those effective coping strategies. Um, and the idea here is that when you are in a more positive frame of mind or a more positive mood, um, you're more open to trying different coping strategies and more able to use uh, more cognitively complex coping strategies. Whereas when you are um, experiencing negative affect, you're your capacity to use different strategies and your um, cognitive capacity kind of diminishes. So you're more likely to use those like withdrawal and avoidance strategies. Um, so this one is uh, in the early stages of the trial and paused, of course, due to um, COVID. So uh, we are one of the sites and then DC is the other site. And we're really hoping to show that um, by doing this text message based intervention to promote positive affect that we see um, improved coping and then ultimately improved diabetes management and better glycemic control. So next I'm going to turn to sleep and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this and talk about um, kind of why we landed on sleep as a potential factor and how we developed and tested an intervention to promote sleep. So uh, recently there's been increased attention on sleep in type 1 diabetes. I think it's been examined um, as a potential risk factor for a while for obesity and type 2 diabetes, but the type 1 work is pretty new. Um, but in a meta-analysis, they found that teens with type 1 obtained significantly shorter sleep duration, so about 26 minutes less than teens without type 1, and also experienced increased sleep disturbances compared to those without type 1 diabetes. And shorter sleep duration and poor sleep quality have been associated with higher um, A1C or glycemic control and problems with self-management, although these have been somewhat inconsistent findings. And variability in sleep duration has also been associated with poor glycemic control and lower frequency of blood glucose monitoring. So when we think about why sleep might be important for diabetes, uh, I think it has a lot of different potential pathways to the outcomes that we're interested in. So first it has physiological effects. And so based on studies of adults with diabetes, um, where they did uh, sleep deprivation, which is I think a little bit harder to do in kids, um, they found that the day after uh, a, a disrupted night sleep or where they kept their sleep to four hours or less, um, they saw elevated blood glucose levels, increased evening cortisol and growth hormone levels, and then decreased insulin sensitivity the following day. Um, and then in studies that have looked at it over time, we see um, on average poor glycemic control in people who are getting insufficient sleep. And then there's also behavioral effects of not getting enough sleep. So I'm sure most of us have experienced these. Um, so the day after a poor night's sleep or insufficient sleep, people are more likely to make poor food choices and particularly they're more likely to choose um, carbohydrate-dense foods, so things like um, snacky foods or sweets. And as you can imagine, that makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, manage diabetes if you're eating a lot of high-carbohydrate foods. Um, people are also less likely to be physically active the day after a poor night's sleep and more sedentary. And finally, uh, we see more behavior problems in people and kids uh, the day after a, a bad night's sleep, and particularly more oppositional behavior. Um, and so when you're thinking about the diabetes management, um, uh, you can see why this would come into play. So if 
a child is tired and grouchy and a parent's asking them about their blood sugar or if they counted the carbohydrates or if they remembered to give insulin, um, they're more likely to kind of come back with a negative response. And so then that can kind of turn into a, a cycle. And finally, sleep has a, a cognitive effects. So we know, again, from the sleep restriction studies that um, sleep deprivation is related to reduced blood flow and decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is really important for executive function skills. So things like cognitive flexibility, which is a, uh, would be used for the mental math of trying to calculate carbohydrates and calculate an insulin dose, and also things like sustained attention, or um, we can see how that might come into play with thinking ahead for what you might need to bring in terms of supplies or um, planning for diabetes management when you're away from home. So the other factor that um, has been examined more recently is this idea of sleep inconsistency or social jet lag. Um, and so we see this in teenagers in particular, but also some adults, depending on their lifestyle, where um, you are accumulating a large sleep debt on weekdays because you're um, having to get up early for school or work and not getting sufficient sleep. And then on the weekends, um, people are extending their bedtime and um, oversleeping, meaning sleeping way past their normal wake time. And the reason this is called social jet lag is that the idea is that um, every Monday morning when you kind of have to get back onto that regular schedule, you feel almost jet lagged because you've essentially shifted your um, sleep timing over that weekend later. And this, this concept or this factor has been associated with um, mood problems, poor academic performance, and obesity in adolescents in the general population and also in, with poor glycemic control in adults with type 1 diabetes and with greater insulin requirements in adolescents with type 1 diabetes. Um, most of these studies were uh, based on uh, self-report of bedtime and wake time. And so um, in one of our studies, we wanted to look at this more carefully with um, actigraphy. And so this is a printout from a teenager who's in our study. So they, we had them wear a watch, an actigraph watch um, for seven days. And this uh, is kind of a, a more precise way of measuring sleep than what you might get with your um, Fitbit or Apple Watch or something like that. Um, and so it uses both uh, movement and light to calculate rest periods and sleep, uh, wake periods. So I can kind of walk you through this. So the little black lines are um, our activity. And then the, the yellow and red and blue are different sources of light. And so when the activity stops and the lights go out, that's considered the beginning of a rest period. And so this bright blue bar is all uh, the rest period here. And then when the lights come back on and the activity starts back up again, that's considered a wake period. Um, there's also a, the, the option for um, people using these devices to um, press an event marker. So you can see these little triangles and that's meant to be when they are planning or when they say they go to bed and when they say they wake up. Um, we ha also had the kids uh, complete sleep diaries every day. And so we use those to help us score. So you can see here that um, we didn't end up using her event marker here because her actual bedtime was quite a bit later. But so this is an actual teenager in our study uh, who was getting actual insufficient sleep as you can see. So most nights she's staying up pretty late, but on school days, she's getting up at six. Um, and then you can see here on the weekend mornings, she's sleeping quite a bit later than she was before. Um, and this, this wasn't even the most dramatic example. I'm sure you guys can uh, think of your own life or your own kids where on the weekends, they might be staying up till three or four and sleeping till noon. So we also looked at average bedtimes on school nights and weekend nights. So each one of these little um, diamonds represents a bedtime average bedtime for one of our participants. So um, I think it's interesting to see here that there's quite a bit of variability in our sample. And these were kids ages 13 to 17. So some of them are going to bed around nine. Uh, a lot of them are staying up later. But our average bedtime for a week school night was 1030, whereas on weekend nights, it was an hour later at 1130. And you also saw like a lot more variability here where, you know, not surprisingly, if somebody was at a sleepover or staying up late, watching movies or playing video games, they're um, extending their bedtime quite a bit on weekends. So we then looked at this in relation to diabetes outcomes. And what we found was that the sleep inconsistency, so that's um, each individual's standard deviation of their sleep duration, 
uh, was related to significantly higher HbA1c, which is kind of our key outcome for glycemic control, and then a lower time and range. So that's how many of their blood glucose values were in the target range, um, and also significantly higher average glucose levels. Um, and interestingly here, we found that the total sleep time, which was the measure of sleep duration, was not significantly related to these things. And that might help to explain why there's been some inconsistency in the literature in terms of sleep duration and glycemic control. So what we took away from this is that it's not just about the duration, it's, it's about the consistency and the timing of sleep as well. Um, we also looked at it in relation to diabetes management and we found that um, it was related to significantly fewer uh, blood glucose checks per day. And when we conducted this study, most kids were using a meter to check their blood glucose. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the goal was really at least four checks per day. And we found that um, their average checks per day was related to the inconsistency. However, it was not related to um, questionnaire measures of self-care. So this is the parent's report on the child's um, self-care inventory of their diabetes management, and then the teen's report of their own diabetes management. Um, those were not significant, but our more objective measure was. And again, the total sleep time wasn't related to anything. Um, so we kind of took all these findings together and decided that we wanted to try to develop and test a sleep-promoting intervention, since this seemed like a, uh, a ripe target for intervention. And to do so, we needed to determine the modifiable aspects of sleep in youth with type 1 diabetes. And um, we did that with qualitative interviews. And specifically, we asked about the role of diabetes-related technology in sleep because we were hearing kind of conflicting reports in our uh, clinical work about how uh, some people found it was easier to sleep with uh, continuous glucose monitor, whereas others said that the alarms kept them up and um, made it more difficult to sleep. And then we assessed the feasibility and acceptability of a sleep promoting intervention. Um, and this is just a sleepy dog picture that <laughs> I try to use as often as possible because I think it's so cute. Um, so the first step was to conduct these qualitative interviews. So we had 25 adolescents and their caregivers. Um, and we interviewed them separately, asking about facilitators and barriers to sleep. And then we um, transcribed them and used qualitative software to analyze them for themes. Um, and the common barriers that we found were electronic use before bed, which is not surprising and is really common among um, adolescents in the general population, but also sleep disturbances related to diabetes management. And uh, caregivers described strategies for helping their child achieve sufficient sleep, but most teens could not identify a sleep facilitator. So when we asked them, what makes it easier for you to get enough sleep, they would say, I don't know, or nothing. And we also heard in these interviews that this weekday and weekend discrepancies in sleep timing were common. So that just kind of validated what we found with the um, actigraphy data. So I have some quotes I wanted to share that I think kind of illustrate these points. Um, so this first one is from a teenage girl and it gets at the electronic use before bed. Um, this one is from a teenage boy and um, sort of addresses uh, the increased demands with extracurriculars and academics in high school, plus some electronics time. <laughs> um, and then I think this one from a teenage girl shows that uh, sleep inconsistency where um, everybody seems to be fine with the idea of staying up much later and sleeping much later on weekends. And then when the parents uh, interviews is really when we heard more about the diabetes uh, effects diabetes related disturbances on sleep. And so here's a parent who's talking about um, how high blood sugar affects their child's sleep. And then this last one is a little bit longer, but I think um, it's interesting to see how much parents are involved in nighttime diabetes management, even in teenagers. So I think we, we hear about it a lot in the parents of younger kids. And I know Randy has done some work in that area. Um, but even the parents of kids who are about to leave for college, they're still up in the middle of the night doing a lot. So based on those findings, um, we created some materials for our sleep promoting intervention. So we worked with a sleep medicine expert at Vanderbilt, Beth Mallow, and she had developed an intervention for kids with autism spectrum disorders. So we took kind of the content from her intervention and then um, tweaked it to make it 
more relevant for our kids with diabetes. Um, and I included this first page because I think it's really important um, that we acknowledge that uh, there's a lot of good reasons why teenagers are not getting enough sleep, or at least in their mind, there's a lot of good reasons. Um, and so to expect them to change those behaviors was, was going to be a, a tough road if we didn't find a way to motivate them or to connect with something that they cared about. So um, we, we started our sessions by talking to them about how sleep could improve these different things that we thought teenagers cared about based on our interviews and clinical experience. Um, so sleep can improve how you feel, how you look, how you drive, how you play sports, perform in school, play music, even how you play video games. Um, and so every kid who was in our uh, study randomized to this condition was able to pick at least one thing that they wanted to try to improve um, through better sleep. And then we uh, reviewed, you know, common sleep problems for teenagers. And then on this next page, um, I have a couple of the pages from our manual that um, address uh, sleep habits and ways to promote better sleep. So the one on the left is really um, general sleep hygiene tips, so nothing revolutionary here. Um, and then the one on the right is the tips that were really specific to diabetes. Um, and so this is where I think we had to make the most adaptations from the, the existing interventions. Um, and this, we had some uh, team members who have type one themselves and they were really helpful in, in thinking through some of the ways that um, teens could prevent unnecessary alarms at night. So things like checking that their battery wasn't low um, or doing a calibration if they needed to. Um, so it, it's really helpful to have <laughs> some insight from people who are living with it for sure. So then we wanted to test this out. Uh, so it's a pilot study. So really our primary outcomes were feasibility and acceptability. Um, and so we had a sample size of 40 and um, these are our sample characteristics. So for our clinic at Vanderbilt, this was pretty representative in terms of um, the race ethnicity and the mean A1C and the insulin pump usage. And so of these 40 dyads, so adolescent and parent, we always try to collect data from both. Um, we uh, randomized 20 to receive the sleep coach intervention, which included a study binder. And I showed you some pages from that. They had three phone sessions with our uh, sleep coach, which was just a trained member of our research team. It was not a sleep medicine expert. Um, and then the usual care group um, really didn't receive anything extra. It was just at six weeks, we did kind of a check to see um, how they were doing with sleep at that point. And then collected data again at three months. In terms of measures, um, with all of our studies, we try to include a mix of uh, self-report measures and more objective measures and try to get both the parent and child perspective. So here we had this uh, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is a widely used measure of sleep in um, adolescents and adults. The Epsworth, Epsworth Sleepiness Scale is about daytime functioning, how sleepy people are during the day. Um, and then the sleep diaries uh, were, were uh, administered during the time that they were wearing the watch as a way to help us score those. But we also got a lot of really interesting information about bedtime, wake time, and nighttime blood glucose checks. Um, and then in terms of our more objective measures, we had the risk actigraphy. I showed you the slide earlier that shows um, how that scored. And that gave us a measure of total sleep time and sleep efficiency. And then we had the HbA1c from their um, regular diabetes clinic visit and blood glucose data from either their meter or their CGM. So as I mentioned, feasibility was really our primary outcome here. And um, we found that 80% of the sleep coaching calls were completed three calls per participant. And um, to be honest, I, this was higher than I thought we would get um, with teenagers today, not really wanting to get on the phone. Um, and I think this is really a testament to my research team and the fact that um, they are pretty young and <laughs> knew how to connect with teens. Um, so we did a lot of uh, texting like the day before to confirm the time, an hour before, five minutes before, like, I'm going to call you, please pick up. Um, so that was really effective. And I mean, there was also some flexibility in terms of scheduling and things like that, but um, to get 80% of teens to do all the calls, I think was pretty impressive. Um, we had five participants withdraw. One of them was a PI initiated withdrawal because they uh, had a new medical diagnosis that affected both sleep and diabetes outcomes. So we felt like that needed to be 
they couldn't stay in the study. Um, and the other, I think one was right after baseline data, they just said they didn't want to do it anymore. And the other three were from the sleep coach group. And so it was about the, the commitment of the calls. Um, we were able to get 90% of our follow-up surveys and sleep diaries collected and 82% of our adolescents had usable actigraphy data, um, which again is pretty high for teens because having them wear a watch for seven days and um, return it, <laughs> uh, it was not always easy. And then um, we were able to get quite a bit of HbA1c data because that comes from the medical records. We also did exit interviews with the teens and parents just to see what they thought about the study and to give us ideas for um, improvement. And then we did look at uh, efficacy just to kind of get an idea of how it worked. Um, and we were really surprised and happy to see that teens in the sleep coach condition slept an average of 48 minutes more per day. And that was um, statistically significant. And they also had an improvement in sleep efficiency based on the actigraphy watches. And um, we also saw an improvement in sleep quality over time. So you can see here that the standard care or usual care group basically stayed exactly the same over three months. And we saw um, on this measure, lower scores mean better sleep quality. So we saw a, a small improvement in our sleep coach group. So in terms of conclusions, um, in terms of for the sleep study, I think what we found was that sleep is really an understudied mechanism to improve outcomes in youth with type 1 diabetes. And so that was why we wanted to target it. And our findings supported the feasibility and acceptability of this intervention. And our initial findings suggest that the potential of a brief behavioral intervention um, to improve sleep duration and quality in teens with type 1 diabetes. Um, as always with a pilot study, larger trials are really needed to establish efficacy. Um, and we didn't see changes in glycemic control or diabetes self-management with this study. So I think a larger sample is probably needed to see that as well. And then just to summarize qualitative interviews or objective um, measures of sleep or um, objective coding of parenting behaviors. Um, and then trying to determine the mechanisms or the modifiable factors, because um, we know that for uh, teens with diabetes, there's some things where we can't really intervene. Really borrowing uh, from or collaborating with uh, people in other um, health or pediatric populations or even in the general population to um, find the best methods and approaches. And finally, to develop and test interventions that are family-based and preventive in nature. So I wanna acknowledge um, my collaborators. I included a pretty uh, broad swath of my work here. And so my, um, I did my postdoc at, at Yale University at the School of Nursing there with Margaret Gray and Robin Whittemore and then Bill Tamberlain is the pediatric endocrinologist there. Um, and then at Vanderbilt, Bruce Compass was my mentor in grad school and I continue to collaborate with him. Bill Russell is our pediatric Endocrine, endocrine division chief. Um, Russell Rothman does health services research. Beth Mallow is the sleep medicine expert. Jill Simmons and Krishman Dottie are on the faculty and the pediatric endocrinologists who work with me on these projects. And I wanna acknowledge funding. Um, and finally, I think we have some time for questions. And these are my kiddos and this is the only time they've worn a collared shirt in the last four months, so. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was great. Very um, informative and crazy to look at your list of funding that all of these projects happen within a short time span. Too. So <laughs> you're quite busy and able to multitask all of these. Um, I have some questions, but I also want to open up so people can unmute themselves if they would like to ask a question or if you want to send something in through the chat. If you're shy, I'm happy to read your question for you. Um, so before I jump in, does anyone else have a question to start? Otherwise, I'll go. I had one question, you know, on the on the whole kind of concept of the your the direction you're going with the sleep. It was, first of all, a very nice talk. Thank you for that. Um, so 
I, when I was reflecting on your data, you know, fundamentally, I think one of the important questions is the disordered sleep associated with the poor glycemic control or is it causative, right? Which obviously is the whole point for you doing a clinical trial. And because I would have just thought, you know, off the top of my head that kids who are less likely to have organized sleep patterns are also less likely to have organized diabetes self-management practices. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, the, the fact, I know that your study wasn't powered to do this, but the fact that you saw no difference in diabetes self-management, even as a proxy marker of glycemic control, you know, does that make you concerned that maybe, maybe it's not worth pursuing a, a larger trial? You know, maybe this is just association and not causation. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, the data on sleep and diabetes is so bi-directional um, that you're right, that one of the ways we can start to tease that apart is by trying to intervene and see what happens. Um, I also had, I worked with a fellow last year who was looking at um, whether sleep improved in kids who were starting to use the, um, the closed loop devices, which um, for people who are less familiar, it's where the the sensor shares information with the insulin pump and it's, it's thought to kind of take the human out of it a little bit. And it's shown um, much better glycemic controls, especially at night when there's not eating going on. Um, and so our hypothesis with that was that um, we would see improvements in sleep and we didn't really. So it's, uh, and again, those devices were pretty new and the, and you know, we're, one of our hypotheses was that people weren't fully trusting it yet. So like parents were still getting up to check kids and things like that. Um, I don't know, I guess it's a good point. Um, I think that I feel like because sleep has so many downstream effects, it's worth trying to improve it. Um, even if we don't immediately see improvements in glycemic control, it might have like a, a longer term effect, um, which is where I think we need a larger sample and a longer follow-up. Um, but yeah. I think that's definitely true. I mean, that there are other benefits. I guess the reason I'm asking is not particularly to, te you know, to question this hypothesis as much as I've spoken with Randy and Maureen some in the past, that there seem to be so many potential areas of intervention, right? You know, for psychosocial improvement in diabetes care. Like there's so many possible areas to target. And me as the kind of a, running a clinical division, I always am like struggling to, to, to get advice, I guess, from you guys about you know, if we can only in clinical practice in actually implement one or two of these, right? Because as you know, they're extremely intensive, you know, mm -hmm. labor intensive and not reimbursed well outside of the research setting to do. So like, I guess in, you know, you gave us a nice overview of a number of different areas. Do you have a feeling of like where the biggest bang for the buck would be? Like what an opinion on that? <laughs> Is that like the million dollar question? Um, yeah, no, it's a, yeah it's, I don't, I mean, I guess I think we're at a stage where we're kind of trying to figure out what works. I think ultimately uh, behavioral science is going to move towards personalized medicine in the same way that um, medical medicine <laughs> is doing. Um, whereas we, where we can start to see like phenotypes of personalities or um, demographic and clinical factors where, oh, th this is a group where like maybe this coping intervention is gonna give you the most bang for the buck. And this is a group where the, the mother's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is gonna give you the most bang for the buck. At this point, I think we need to kind of develop as many efficacious interventions as we can. And then we could ultimately maybe plug and play a little bit better, um, but we're still kind of early in those stages. And as you know, behavioral interventions don't tend to show huge effect sizes um, because they're messy and they're humans and it, it's it's tricky. Um, but I think the fact that we're also not seeing huge effect sizes with new diabetes devices and better insulins and better management is shows us that there's there's still room for some of these interventions to, to be really helpful for families. And I think that's where screening can come into play too, because if there was more widespread screening, like right now we're really screening for mood in most clinics. And so that's one area that absolutely can impact diabetes management and glycemic control. But they're like, if we screened more broadly, then we might be able to see, okay, this is, you know, uh, like Sarah said, like this is a better individualized intervention 
for you. I'm not saying we go and do that right now because we have to know what the interventions are, where to place people. Um, but I think you wouldn't know about sleep if you don't ask. I mean, that's something that in our um, intake interviews for behavioral health, we always ask about sleep, but I don't think that's something that comes up in all medical visits. Um, and clearly, I mean, right now is such a huge time with sleep and inconsistency with COVID and people, you know, remote learning and then summer plans not, you know, um, going as planned. And so I think unless you are, you know, have sleep in your, you either did sleep clinic as a provider or you study sleep, like most kids are not being woken up at the same time or being sent to bed at the same time. A lot like my kids are complaining constantly, like, we're the only ones we know who are, you know, still needing to go to sleep, isn't it the summer and blah, blah, blah. And I still have, I said, look, this is much later than it was during the school year, but we still have to have some sense of normalcy here. Like I can't have you, I mean, it's from our, as much my mental health as it is for their, you know, behavioral health. I just, I can't have it that way, but I don't think a lot of people are, you know, necessarily doing that. So I don't know. I think sleep is a big thing. Sarah, you talked about in like the sleep inconsistency, which I thought was so interesting. So mm -hmm. can you tell us how you measure that and clinically what you would consider sleep inconsistency to be? Yeah. So the way we measured it in that study was based on the actigraph device data. Um, we did like the individual standard deviation of sleep duration of total sleep time over the seven nights. So we, but then I think you saw probably that the statistician broke out our findings by weeknights and um, weekend nights um, because there was such a discrepancy. Um, so I think, you know, there's probably more sophisticated ways to do like a, a statistical analysis of that. But I think what we were getting at was basically individual variability. So we know that across people, there's going to be variability. Um, so what our sleep medicine, Dr. Mallow, who I've worked with, um, what she has said is like, just in terms of practical clinical suggestion is to try not to sleep or go to bed or sleep in more than two hours past your kind of weekday time. So it's not like you need to get your kids up at six on a Saturday morning if they don't need to be up, um, but maybe don't let them sleep till noon. Um, so I know that's not popular in my household <laughs> either. Um, so yeah, my son is like, please, please let me sleep in. Uh, so it's hard though. I mean, I think as parents, when we know that they're in that sleep debt as well, where we see that they're not getting enough sleep on school nights back in kind of normal times where they had to get up for the bus or uh, to get to school on time, um, that you kind of want to let them catch up on the weekends. But I think these findings suggest that, that it doesn't really work that way. And it's better to try to have some consistency and maybe squeeze in a nap on occasion, a, sh a shortish nap um, versus this like extremes of, you know, getting four hours a night and then 12 hours a night kind of thing. Um, so yes, I think in terms of clinically, I would, I guess I would say more than a two hour discrepancy would be considered sort of inconsistency. And it's both the timing and the duration. So it's not just that you know, they're still going to bed at 10 and they're sleeping till 10. It's that they're going to bed at two and sleeping till 10. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I have one other question about the single parents that you found in your descriptive study about the different coping related to diabetes outcomes or the different parenting, I guess. Um, have you seen that in your interventions at all? Seen differences in the way interventions seem to work for two-parent families versus single parents? We, you know, we had done pilot work on that parent intervention, and it was really too small of a sample to look at that. So that is one of the things that we plan to look at in the current trial. Um, I mean, I think anecdotally, so I, I supervise the interventionists, and so I kind of hear how things are going in those calls. Um, anecdotally, I think the single parents are just often dealing with more stressors. and it's really hard to kind of disentangle because they often, at least in our sample, a lot of them are also in our lower income brackets um, and might be dealing with some other uncertainties and things in their lives. So uh, it's, it's hard to tease it apart, but I do think there's something about that kind of feeling like it's all on you and, um, and feeling like if the kids aren't doing well with diabetes, it's like 
kind of one more thing that maybe you're not doing well as a parent. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I think we've seen that more descriptively. And we do try to look in our interventions, but it also depends on sample size, right? Trying to have enough to look at differences between marital status. Yeah, we do ask a question um, in our like parent survey about if they if there's another caregiver that helps because mm -hmm. because you're single doesn't mean that there isn't right. somebody else um, like a grandparent or a, a friend or somebody who's helping you. Um, and then we asked about like how how much does that person help like on you know zero to one hundred percent and then how is it helpful or not helpful and that has been really funny because some they'll be like oh my ex-husband is very involved and it's not helpful. Um, so just having another person around isn't always perceived as helpful. <laughs> Even if it's married and not ex, that's so, yeah. Yes. I think that's what they ask how helpful. All right, well, I see the time. I want to um, thank everyone for joining us and especially thank you to Sarah for that um, interesting talk and for sharing a lot of your different work with us. That was really- Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. We are not meeting tomorrow for uh, CTR Connect, but we will regroup for that next Tuesday. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, Bye -bye. good to see you, Maureen. Maureen, Bye. have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, everyone should have fun. Sarah, have fun. Have a good week. <laughs> Thanks, you too. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>